So over the past couple of months, we've been building a lot of systems, some of them old, a lot of them budget and new, but I wouldn't actually class them as budget, mostly because they're just too expensive. So what I've actually done today is I've put a system together, which I do find meets my definition of a budget gaming PC. And I'm gonna show you exactly what it is and why that is. Now, when it comes to building a budget gaming PC, there are many different definitions of what budget actually is. Most people will actually consider it as the price. And if we are talking about financial terms and new generations, yes, the stuff that we've actually been building recently with lower end graphics cards, lower end CPUs would actually technically be classed as budget gaming PCs, but I don't actually define them that way. I would actually see them more as entry level current generation gaming PCs that don't really meet most people's definition of budget. My definition of budget is actually based on a comparison basis. So in terms of technology, in terms of gaming PCs, that would be in comparison to something like a games console. After all, a games console is a more or less a budget gaming device. So to me, a budget gaming PC should cost roughly between 400 and 450 pounds. That's because that is the bracket that you can purchase a current generation or new generation games console in. And unfortunately, you're not gonna get that in the new market as we've shown on the channel in our previous videos. Gaming PC technology across the board is generally up in price which means the lowest you can kind of really build something that is more than capable and entry level is around the 700 to 800 pound mark which of course is double the price of a current generation console so some people are right in saying that you probably should go that route but of course we've also got the used market and that's exactly what i've built this machine from this is a machine that has been built from the used market of some pretty impressive parts and they do actually meet the definition that i gave previously a system like this wouldn't take much to actually put together and inside of it we've got some pretty impressive parts to be honest for the motherboard we've got a basic a320 amd board which is actually pretty suitable for most CPUs. In fact, this board that we've got here will actually take up to an AMD Ryzen 5800X. So you've always got a decent upgrade path there. Sitting inside the board, we've got the very trusty AMD Ryzen 5 3600. That is a six core 12 bed processor that is slightly starting to show its age now, but it is still more than capable. And you can pick them up at really cheap prices of around 50 pounds. So that actually makes a decent baseline for a system like this. For the memory, we've got 16 gigabytes of DDR4. Of course, being DDR4, you're gonna make a little bit of a saving here because it is at some fantastic prices right now. And we've opted for some HyperX with the RGB, which means it's gonna look pretty nice in the system. You can pick up 16 gigabytes of DDR4 in eight gigabyte sticks, pretty cheap nowadays. On the second hand market, you can get it as low as 15 pounds, but if you do look new, you can pick it up for roughly around 30. Now, unfortunately, the motherboard that we've got here doesn't support any kind of NVMe slot, so we've had to go for something on the SATA when it comes to storage. And for that, we've gone for a very basic, crucial 480 gigabyte SATA SSD. Now you can actually get these boards with an NVMe slot. So if you are on the lookout for them, it's probably worth actually picking one of them up because it's gonna give you a little bit of extra storage space and speed going forward, but it is not mandatory for a system like this. A SATA SSD would actually be perfectly fine. The case was one that we picked up not so long ago and we actually managed to get this case for only 19 pounds on eBay. If you do actually go out there and you hunt around and you do some waiting, you can find some pretty decent bargains like this. It is a Cooler Master Micro ATX case and it's got full ventilation all the way around. So airflow is not gonna be a problem. And it actually looks pretty smart on the desk too. So of course it suits all of the components that we've got in here, perfectly fine. And of course it has a pretty decent build quality too. When it comes to additional cooling, we actually installed into this system four Arctic fans. They are 120 millimeter and they are PST fans as well. So they all connect together and you can simply just plug them onto one header on the motherboard. So you're gonna get some pretty decent cooling there with the limitations that the board provides. And then of course, for the cooling of the CPU, we've actually just stuck with the stock AMD cooler that actually came with the CPU itself. They're not the greatest coolers, but they do work, even though sometimes they can be a little bit noisy. But as soon as you pop the side on the case, it should be perfectly fine. To power this entire system, we are actually running with a pretty decent power supply here, and it is somewhere where I would recommend that you spend the most. And in terms of this system, it was probably the second most expensive part for that we've gone for a evga 750 watt gold rated power supply it is a fully modular unit and we actually paid around 70 pounds for it second hand it's been a fantastic unit ever since we got it and of course being evga it is a very strong unit that will last for years it's always worth putting that decent power supply in a system like this because at least when you come to upgrade you won't have to actually replace something like that it's more than enough to power most things and then of course we come to the last part of the system. Every gaming PC needs a pretty decent graphics card. And for that, 
we've gone for probably one of the best price to performance units on the second hand market and that is the AMD Radeon RX 5700 XT. The model that we've got in this system here is the Gigabyte model. I did look up the prices of these and you can get them between 100 and 150 pounds. So that's actually a pretty good bargain for the kind of performance that you're getting here. They have got faster and faster over time since launch and they are still well supported by AMD. So you're going to get some decent support on it. You've got a pretty decent future on it, particularly for the price range. And to be honest, the performance of it is still pretty good. All of these components combined actually make a pretty decent system that only come in at around £399. Of course, to be able to find a system like this and all of the components together, you do have to do a little bit of waiting and hunting, but it's not impossible. It is out there. And in actual fact, we've got many builders on our Discord community that can build this system even cheaper. But this is generally the rough kind of price that you're going to pay. And of course, it actually is a little bit cheaper than a current gen games console. So it meets our definition of budget perfectly fine. Now, if you are impressed with the price of this, you should definitely check out the performance. Because this system is a little bit older now, we did restrict all of our testing to a 1080p resolution, although that doesn't mean that it is completely restricted to that. But in the tests that we did, we got some pretty decent results. In games like Cyberpunk 2077 with a high preset and enabling FSR 2.1 with a quality setting, you're going to get a pretty smooth gameplay experience with an average FPS of around 80 and a 1% low of 46. With these kind of settings, the game does look absolutely stunning. It runs perfectly smooth and there is no major stuttering whether you're inside or outside of cars. So that's a pretty decent experience there. In even newer games like Dead Island 2 with a 1080p resolution and a high preset, you're going to be looking at getting around 120 frames per second with a 1% low of 80. With these kind of performance, the game looks absolutely fantastic as it always does. And you're actually starting to border a high FPS experience here with the game running super smooth. For any Dead Island 2 fans out there, this kind of system would be perfect to play this game on and you're not going to have any issues at all. Hogwarts Legacy is a little bit more demanding though, but still running the game at a 1080p resolution with a high preset and enabling FSR 2 with a quality setting. This system will see around 90 frames per second on average with a 1% low of 42. Even with those slightly low 1% lows there, the game still runs perfectly smooth with no major stuttering and even reaches a high FPS experience outside of the towns. Even new releases like Horizon Forbidden West with a 1080p resolution and a high preset, you will see around 72 frames per second on average average with a 1% low of 59. The game with this configuration still plays super smooth and it looks absolutely amazing too, especially with no need for any kind of upscaling to achieve a good 60 FPS experience. I'm actually really liking this game at the moment and I can completely play it through with this kind of setup. Robocop Rogue City is one of those titles that is super demanding and it really does challenge a lot of hardware, but with this system you're going to get a pretty decent experience and that's because of AMD's FSR 3 with frame generation. Running the game in 1080p with a high preset while enabling FSR 3 with a quality setting and turning on frame generation, you'll see a high FPS experience here of 124 frames per second on average with a 1% low of 92. That means that the game actually runs very well with little stuttering and the graphics look absolutely amazing. So FSR 3 here kind of really pulls this system up to a more modern type of performance. Starfield has got better over time since its release. It's actually had a lot of updates now, so the game starts to run pretty well on most hardware and there is no different on this system. Running the game in 1080p with a high preset while enabling FSR 3 on with 100% render resolution, so it's not really upscaling at all and enabling frame generation, you will get a high FPS experience here of 120 frames per second with a 1% low of 70. The game runs absolutely great with this configuration and to be honest, if you were to disable FSR 3 in frame generation, you would still actually get a pretty decent average of 60 FPS. So it's not actually needed, but if you did want to take this system to the next level, you clearly could with that. The last game in our testing was The Last of Us Part 1. Running that game in a 1080p resolution with a high preset, we did need to enable FSR 3 with a quality setting and frame generation to really kind of boost it up to a high FPS experience. With this configuration you'll get around 134 frames per second on average with a 1% low of 56. The game looks absolutely fantastic and is really smooth with this setup which completely transforms it from an okay game to play to a high FPS experience. All of the games in our testing were completely playable on this system and they all provided a pretty decent experience which is absolutely amazing for a system that costs less than a new generation console. Although sometimes due to the uh, slightly older CPU, you will wait around a little bit for things like compiling shaders. And of course, while doing it, this CPU can get a little bit warm with that stock cooler, but with a bit of configuration with the right fan curves and that, you can actually get it controlled and the system will work perfectly fine for a long time. 
Now, I don't know about you guys, but I find this system actually quite impressive. It did cost less than a current generation console, so it meets my definition of a budget gaming PC. And in fact, if I was a budget gamer, this is exactly what I would be building, particularly if I wanted a PC. There are many benefits of going to a PC. Of course, a console will perform slightly better than this at those higher resolutions. But for many people wanting to go to PC, it's not always about the performance. Lots of people don't want monthly subscriptions, which you have to do on a console. PCs, you don't need to. Lots of people want to be able to play their backwards compatible games for a longer time. The PC will give you that benefit. And of course, with a PC, you can do lots of other things like photo editing, business stuff. You can do lots of different things. So lots of people do opt to go this route. But I think budget gamers really do need to look at this kind of thing. The new market just isn't cutting it for the budget gamer, in my opinion. They are just far too expensive for the performance you're getting, particularly when you can build something like this that will play the games that you want to do. So definitely, if you are a budget gamer, go check this out. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this system. Do you have a system similar? Would you build something similar? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content. And I'm sure as always, catch you guys in the next one.